Michael Dennis is a research scientist at DeepMind. His work is focused on the automatic generation of environments suitable for training RL agents. Uh, these works vary from co-creating the Gen IE envir uh, generative environment model, trained from unlabeled internet videos, to helping pioneer the field of unsupervised environment design for automatically generating curricula of environments. His research aims to bridge the gap between classical decision theory and model deep learning, uh, modern deep learning. Before joining DeepMind, he received his PhD from the Center for Human Compatible AI at UC Berkeley. Thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, I just wanted to have a quick slide on. So all this is just still like cutting edge, unsettled science. Um, I don't presume to know actually how the universe works or how the future of the field's going to go. Um, but I think that uh, I think that I have some arguments, which to me are pretty convincing that this is going to be an important direction going into the future. And so I've tried to format the, format this talk in a way so that you can come to your conclusions. Um, and so you should feel empowered to question anything that I'm posing here. Um, it's my job to try to convince you, and you're the authority on what you believe. Um, and science is the process for making sure that we don't fool ourselves. And so I'm just here to give you the arguments. Um, and it's uh, a bit of your responsibility to make sure that uh, you actually believe these arguments and don't just take my word for it. So that being said, um, I'm going to use some running examples throughout this talk. Um, and so my first set of running examples are empirical examples of RL systems breaking. So um, it's a pretty well re replicated phenomenon that if you train an RL system, even in pretty simple environments, um, in uh, like, yeah, in very simple environments, and then at test time you train, change basically anything about the environment, the system will just fail arbitrarily. Um, so over here on the left, you can see that like um, this used to be animated, but this like uh, three by three room where there's a key and a door, um, this agent was trained where like the key and the door were in slightly different places. And then if you, uh, yeah, the key and the door were trained to uh, place that they were in slightly different places. Um, and if you move the key or the door, it no longer knows how to navigate to pick one up and go to the other. Um, and so this was tried in all four of these environments down here. Basically, the same result happens. Um, in this middle one, um, it's a game where you're trying to outline all of the parts of the maze. And if you just change the starting position of the agent, it doesn't know how to do that anymore. Um, and then this persists even when you try to train it in a lot of like randomly generated environments. So this is an example. Um, in like coin run and proc gen, where you like go and you try to jump and reach to uh, like this sort of coin at the right end of the level. Um, and so typically the coin is always on the far right. Um, if you train it in that situation and then change where the coin is, um, the agent will typically run, jump over the coin and go proceed to the far right of the level and then jump against the wall, confused as to why the level's not ending. Um, and so all of this is to sort of say that like RL can be very brittle especially if you change anything that wasn't changed during training. On the other side, um, I'm going to be using these running examples for RL working. Um, so this is, uh, I guess, Gnome over there. Um, we heard from him yesterday. This is him in the World Series of Poker. Uh, I couldn't find a better uh, picture of his actual poker bot, so that's just him playing poker. Um, of course, OpenAI5, Diplomacy, um, these are Xland and Ada, two different ways, like um, RL systems where you've, uh, we've generated a bunch of different uh, training environments to train um, RL agents in, and they, it results in them being able to solve a vast, a huge variety of different tasks. Um, of course, uh, Alpha Star, Alpha Go, um, Alpha Chess, like Alpha Zero. Um, and then uh, I guess last year we also got Gran Turismo, which is uh, the Sony AI people were able to make human level driving in basically a photorealistic uh, F1 simulator. Um, and so all of these are uh, situations in which the uh, RL systems have performed like beyond our expectations um, and been able to get superhuman or human level performance in a complex variety of settings. I mean, if we contrast that with the previous slide, um, it's quite a stark difference. We see things failing in things that are so simple that we can't really understand how they're even failing. Um, 
And we compare that with things that are working so well that we can't even comprehend the moves that they're doing because they're above our understanding. Um, and so part of what I'm hoping I can give you a little, little bit of in intuition for is why there's such a stark dis difference between these two classes. Um, and so claim one is that deep RL policies only generalize when they see a range of environments which punish all non-general policies. Um, so I think that if we look back at, um, I guess some intuition for this is that um, neural networks themselves only really generalize if they seem an extremely diverse range of inputs. Um, and so this is sort of inherited by deep RL. Deep RL only generalizes when it sees a diverse enough range of environments that um, where here diversity means importantly different for the neural network. Um, and so if we look back at our two, uh, oh, two running examples, all of the th places where deep RL has been in, uh, insanely successful, you can see that the other side of the board, so um, I get like in poker or OpenAI um, open five or alpha zero, all of these, the, like the other players that um, are like standing in for the human are adapting um, dramatically throughout training. You're seeing a huge variety of different things that those agents can do. Um, and that diversity is something that makes the RL agent actually robust so that when you plug in an actual human that it hasn't seen before, um, it's good enough at all of the things that it has seen to be able to actually work on that. And then uh, in all of these examples, this is just changing some aspect of the environment that hasn't, it hasn't seen trained before, like changed that way before. Um, and even if the environment is so simple that it should be, just be able to like, like it's, it's clearly within the comprehension of like a really capable deep RL system. Um, if you make those sorts of small changes, it fails. Um, so this is like some, uh, I think pretty strong evidence of the hypothesis that deep RL algorithms only work. Um, if you can show it enough variation to make sure that it has to work. Um, so claim two is uh, that to design a static distribution of environments, which punish all non-general policies, you must know the generalizable policy. Um, and so some intuition for this um, is that, uh, yeah, you need to have sort of anticipated all of the shortcuts that um, that it could have used to try to solve the environment without, uh, without actually going about reasoning through the task in a way that would generalize to all possible environments. And so if there's any way that it could have overfit to any possible feature of the environment, um, deep RL policies have a nature to just do that. And so uh, whenever you change those sorts of features, it's going to start failing at test time. Um, and so one way to see sort of the um, yeah, so to think about how difficult this would have to be would be if you're trying to do this in like photorealistic, like human level environments, you'd have to uh, make sure that it never sees anything that would make the environment seem different than reality. So you would have to make sure that you get all of the textures of every sort of surface in the environment uh, right down to like small details because those details could be picked up by a neural net. It could overfit to some of those details and not actually make a robust image detector. And then when those details change, when it gets into reality, the policy fails for reasons that are hard to debug. You would have to mimic all of the floor layouts and clutter of all of these real world environments. I mean, just look around this room, how complicated it would be just to describe where all the objects are. Um, if you have any sort of correlation or procedural generation that has any sort of like structure that the agent might be able to pick up on, um, that's something that when you put it into a real world environment, it can just fail and would be very difficult for you to debug. Um, you need to also do this for the weird tail case, edge cases of things that actually people make. So people make some pretty weird stuff and you have to make sure that your simulator makes equally weird stuff. Um, and you have to do this for like even a bunch of, uh, I guess like this is sort of the weird ed, like, um, long tail of edge cases that we've seen in self-driving where there's always some new bizarre situation that you can find the car in and causes the policy to do something that you hadn't anticipated. Um, yeah, so like the general messages, like what we specify about our environments, um, we depend on. And so if we 
uh, have to describe something about reality. Um, like anything that we actually have to describe about reality is something that our policy might overfit to and then cause it not to transfer into actual real world settings. And so if we go back to the, our two running examples, we can see that the um, that all of these are like fixed in different ways, um, which cause it to actually uh, like clearly these are instances where you haven't actually specified the right distribution of environments. Um, and so if you change anything, it, the policy just doesn't work. And here we've sort of gotten away from having to specify the dist a fixed distribution. It's not like we're training against a fixed distribution of components in like AlphaGo or AlphaStar um, or uh, Libertus. We in all of these settings, if you if you imagine training like trying to write down a policy or even trying to like um, like behavioral clone a policy or something, and training against those fixed policies as opposed to training against these like complex multi agent systems. Um, the resulting like AI that you learned against them probably wouldn't work. Um, actually, I think in most of these domains we've tried that and it just doesn't work. Um, and the reason is because the like even if you got really like a, a astoundingly astoundingly good human model, you still have this long tail of edge cases where you like overfit to some aspect of the model and it do doesn't generalize to human performance. Um, whereas all of these methods get around that fact by um, adaptively changing the distribution of uh, levels or players that you're against in a way that actually causes the agent to be able to learn something generalizing. Um, and so the final claim is that even though you can't do this with static distributions, you can do this with dynamic distributions of environments. So dynamic distributions of environments can punish all non-general policies. And the, the constructive argument for this is that all you need to do is find some environment where the agent could have done better and repeat this environment until the agent does do better, uh, and just keep repeating this. Um, and if you do this, then you know that the dynamic distribution of environments, um, well, I mean, this is like a pretty straightforward construction of how a dynamic distribution of environments could punish all non-general policies. And in fact, it doesn't, we don't need to know the um, actual optimal way of solving the environment to do this. We just need to find some place where the agent isn't completely optimal and try to make it a little bit better. And so if we, uh, go back to like all of these examples. All of these uh, have some sort of adversarial notion to them. Um, they have some agent in the system who is motivated to find a flaw in the system that we're training and keep pointing out that flaw until our system improves. Uh, and so I think that recipe of these like, uh, like of dynamically generating distributions of env environments or players is the secret behind most of the RL successes that we see in the world. And that um, it's like the secrets to actually making really robust deep RL policies. Um, and so uh, I claim that if you believe claims one through three, then dynamic distributions of environments are required for generalizable superhuman deep RL policies. Um, superhuman because um, if you uh, if you like claim two requires that uh, like if you like if you are trying to go for a policy that uh, that some human player could do, like if you actually understand the optimal policy, then in theory, maybe you can try to actually painstakingly go and describe a distribution of environments. But if you're going for superhuman policies, you're not gonna be able to anticipate all the possible edge cases that you're gonna need to do. Um, and so uh, if you take all three claims together, then uh, it's, you're sort of forced to have to um, to use dynamic distributions of environments or dynamic distributions of data in order to make generalizable policies. And so one big caveat to this is that even after using adaptive di distributions of policies, they don't necessarily give you adversarial robustness. They give you generalizability. Um, but if you take a specific train policy and try to attack it, you typically find a full, uh, some sort of flaw. So I, I don't want people to over, over index on this. Um, and so two examples are so this is something that I worked on um, with Adam Gleave and others um, in early in grad school. So these are two agents um, playing soccer. The blue agents trying to uh, kick the ball into the goal and the red end agents trying to block it. Um, they were trained in self-play. So they're actually reasonably generalizable policies. Um, cool. And then if you train an adversarial blue agent against the red agent, um, Oh, sorry, adversarial red agent against the blue agent. 
um, what you find is that the red agent can just sort of fall on the ground and twitch in a weird way. And the blue agent gets very upset or confused or something. And sometimes struggles to get close to the ball um, and occasionally makes it, but usually just has a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so even typically generalizable policies can um, have these sorts of surprising failure modes. Um, and you can find these in even really superhuman policies. So this, this is uh, some adversarial attacks that we found in Codigo. Um So the one on the left is something that I hand designed to try to exploit some weaknesses in MCBS search. Um, the details of that are in the appendix. I probably shouldn't spend the time right now to go through all of that. Um, the detail, the one on the right, we found through just fixing Codigo and doing a sort of adversarial search to try to design board states which uh, the network uh, finds uh, like performed poorly at. Um, and so I guess we covered this a little bit yesterday in Gnome's talk, um, uh, but I would, in, I think people would find it interesting to check that out if you haven't already. Um, the Board state on the right is actually intuitive enough that there are some people on our team who were like amateur Go players who were able to sort of over the board um, in Kata Go games, navigate to board state similar enough to this that they were actually able to be Kata Go like um, at least like 30 to 40% of the time. Um, and so this is actually like sort of a human repl replicable way of beating a like normally superhuman agent. Um, and so even when you're doing these sorts of really adaptive ways of training agents, uh, you should still expect that there's going to be adversarial attacks that maybe even humans would be able to do. Cool. Um, and then before I get into the details of like sort of how you should go about thinking of uh, like doing research in unsupervised environment design, I wanted to go over a couple common critiques. So the first one is like, why don't humans need to do this? I mean, it doesn't seem like my environment is constantly changing around me, and it seems like I generalize somewhat fine. Um, I think that this. Uh, uh, I think that we do find proxies of this. So one thing is that uh, we often learn new ideas through uh, imagining different edge cases or being exposed to different edge cases, trying to test the limits of the ideas that are extreme. Um, and I think that this like sort of generalizable world model allows us to get around a lot of the things that DeepRL is struggling with. Um, it might po point to some sort of difference between how DeepRL currently works, like at least policy-free DeepRL and how like humans are thinking through these sorts of issues. Um, and I guess like from a pragmatic standpoint, the other concern is typically how do we get this sort of distribution of environments? Like in the more traditional way of thinking of RL, you like have an agent out in the world trying to train in like real world physics. Um, and so if you're, or like if you're trying to like, um, if you're trying to make an RL agent that will work for reality, you'll need to have a distribution of environments which covers something close to reality. Um, and so this, uh, I'll cover this more in detail later in the talk, but the main message is that I think general, generalizable and scalable world models are on their way. It's just mostly a matter of scale and compute um, and like research to be able to um, make simulators that will look, uh, that will be uh, photorealistic and will allow agents to like, um, in simulation, act in designed worlds to make policies that will generalize in this way. Um, but I'll cover that more at the end of the talk. Cool, okay. Now that I've hopefully convinced you all that this is the future of the field, um, this, is, this next part of the talk is just going into how do you actually go about thinking about unsupervised environment design and sort of what are the like um, sort of open research questions and things that you might, uh, might trip you up as you go through. Um, this is still a very active, area of research. So these are mostly just like my perspective on um, things that might um, be useful for people to know about. Um, so the first thing is that if you're doing any research on unsupervised environment design, you should know about JAX. So um, last year, um, Chris Liu started uh, translating a bunch of environment, uh, deep RL environments into JAX. And what this does is it means that when you train um, an RL agent, it doesn't need to go back and forth between the CPU to run the environments and the GPU to train the agents. You can leave it all on GPU. And so this results in a 4,000 times speed up 
of how quickly you can train the agents. And so if you have a GPU and you're trying to do RL research or environment design research, I would suggest looking into this because it will save you a lot of time. It'll make your iteration speed so much faster that you can run several experiments in a day, whereas previously it would have taken a week. Um, this has been, uh, later last year, was translated to Jack's model for multi-agent environments. And then in the past, I guess, six to eight months, um, there's been two libraries coming out that translate all of the environment design algorithms I'm about to talk to into um, Jack's RL. So you can uh, do environment design experiments that previously took me two weeks and within a day. Um, cool. And so getting to the formalism. So unsupervised environment design starts with this um, underspecified POM DP. So this is like a regular POM DP. You can just think of it as a, um, uh, yeah, you can eff effectively think of it as a level editor. So if you have like your favorite video game, there's like some sort of like things you can change about the environment. That's effectively a UPOM DP. It's like a regular POM DP, except it has these sorts of extra parameters that you can use to specify things about the environment. Um, so in this case, you have this like, blue agent, which is like the starting point, the green block, which is like the goal it's trying to navigate to, and then all these gray blocks that you can put down to like get in the blue agent's way that it has to navigate around. And so once you place all of those, you get this POM DP, which is in this case, a partially observable environment where the agent can sort of see this like um, bluish area around it um, and is trying to navigate to the green goal. Um, and so what you can start to do once you have this sort of space of environments you can train in is to try a bunch of different sorts of environment distributions and see sort of what sort of policies you can get out in the at equilibrium. Um, so one natural thing you might want to do is try domain randomization. This is just throwing random blocks onto the uh, into the world um, and hoping that some of those will be interesting environments. Um, and what you find if you just like look at that distribution is it doesn't look like any sort of real world environments you've ever seen. Um, the vast majority of random environments don't really have mean anything. Or don't like aren't really useful for training on. Um, another intuition here is if you try to like make random like put random atoms in the universe, you're not ever going to get any sort of useful universe, right? There's just like a lot of structure in any reasonable environment um, that you're going to want some agent to build intentionally. Because random like in the space of random environments, it's just way too large to have any reasonable probability of finding anything useful. Um, and so that's going to be more and more true the higher dimensional environments you get to. Um, so another option would be adversarial training. So you try to adversarially generate an environment to make the performance of the agent you're training as low as possible. Um, and that does give you some sorts of structure. So you can see like gener generated walls here that wouldn't typically happen by chance. But what you find is that the um, adversary can just block the goal off into a corner. And so the uh, agent tends to never see any sorts of solvable environments. So never it really gets any sort of reward signal and it's not really a useful distribution of training environments. So in this, we've solved the problem of having no structure, but now all the structure is sort of making the environments really bad to solve. Um, and so the final suggestion um, for this part of the talk um, is minimax regret. And so the idea here is to generate environments where the agent has some more improving left to do, right? So it's, um, I guess more concretely, it's try to generate environments such that the difference between the um, performance that the policy gets and the performance that the optimal policy would get is as large as possible. Um, so these are the environments where the agent has the highest loss. Um, and so specifically, this environment, the agent has no loss. It's optimal. Any agent is optimal because there's nothing you can do. Um, and so if you're trying to design an environment where the agent is, uh, uh, the difference between what the agent could do and what the agent actually does is as high as possible. What you want to do is make sure that the environment is solvable, but that this particular agent doesn't solve it or at least take a long time to solve it. And so what you do is you make these sorts of hopefully maze looking environments where the uh, agent needs to try to find its way to the goal, but um, hopefully either gets confused or takes a long time to get there and so incurs a lot of regret. Um, and so part of the hypothesis is that these sorts of environments are going to be the best environments to train in because they're the environments where there's most the most improving left to be done. 
Um, but uh, I think that uh, the jury is sort of still out as to whether Minimax regret is the best way of trying to find distributions of environments. I'm, I think it's like a pretty good way and will get us like a good portion of the way there, but I think there's some, uh, there's a few things specifically that we would definitely want to change about it. Um, I'll cover more in detail some of these alternatives later in the talk, but the whole um, framework is designed so that this is a parameter that people can change because I don't think that we have a like clear, definite answer to this. Um, and I want people to keep thinking about different ways of trying to make distributions of environments. I think it's a really interesting area for new research. Um, and so one thing that um, I want to start, start with is that a lot of people, when they see Minimax regret, think that it's pessimistic. Um, I think in part because there's this sort of like, um, I guess, max here over negative worlds, which ends up being like, a, like an adversary trying to make the environment bad for you or like make the environment like um, one where you don't have a lot of, like you could improve a lot. Um, and that feels very related to make the environment like adversarial to you. And so people feel like it might be pessimistic. Um, oh, okay. And so, uh, yeah, this is an example just showing that minimax regret actually isn't pessimistic. So if you offer minimax regret policies a lottery ticket and you don't tell them what the, like, what the probability of the payoff is. Um, so in this case, you have two options, either buy the lottery ticket, it costs $2 and you can get $100 if it wins, or you can pass on it and keep all of your money. Um, a minimax regret agent will choose um, the, at least will buy the lottery ticket a good proportion of the time. Like I think they end up flipping a coin and the vast majority of the time they buy the lottery ticket um, because they would regret not buying the lottery ticket. Um, and so this is a sense in which minimax regret in, at least in this context, is risk-seeking rather than risk-averse. Um, and so it's better to think of min-max regret as ambiguity-averse rather than risk-averse. Um, it doesn't like situations where um, the optimal thing is uh, like, like there's fundamental trade-offs in the environment that's like a source of ambiguity to it and is trying to like minimize the extent to which there's some sort of ambiguity. Um, another interesting thing that you should know about minimax regret is that uh, it sort of hedges trade-offs. So uh, the uh, so in this environment over on the left, like you're just trying to guess whether the coin is going to be heads or tails. Um, in this environment, you uh, minimax regret will just randomize between the two. It'll um, yeah, it'll uniformly randomly guess heads or tails because that's the thing that like most hedges the trade-off between like guessing 100% heads and guessing 100% tails. Um, if given an option to hedge explicitly, um, so it has like like uh, some option where it will get 51 in either case, it will choose that because it hedges against both the probability like possibilities. Um, what it wants to do is find a situation where any uncertainty that it has in the world is um, as irrelevant to it as possible. Right? It's trying to make all the uncertainty that it has basically irrelevant if there's any way to do so. Um, Cool. And so the last thing that's super important about minimax regret um, in practice is that pure minimax regret strategies choose policies which always succeed whenever such a policy exists. Um, so to be more concrete about this, if you have a situation where like um, where like the outcomes that you can get are clustered into these two buckets, one is success, which tends to have really high like performance, and one is failure, which tends to have really low performance, and there's a big gap between these two. Um, if there's some policy which always succeeds um, or succeeds whenever any other policy succeeds, minimax regret will choose that. Um, so in this situation, um, pi 2 succeeds whenever any other policy succeeds because like, it's, it's the only policy which ever succeeds. So minimax regret will, uh, deterministic minimax regret will choose pi 2. Um, in this setting, um, there's something that succeeds in every row. The only thing that always succeeds is pi 1. And so minimax regret uh, deterministic minimax regret, at least, will choose pi one. Um, so this is a, some motivation as to why, if you have a setting where really all you care about is mostly this binary, like did it do the task or did it not do the task, minimax regret will uh, always do the task if there's some method by which doing the task all the time is possible. Um, and so these are sort of like 
Um, uh, yeah, those matrices I showed were just like really disguised versions of the two examples I had shown before, actually. Um, cool. And so now we get to the point where we can talk about how do we actually optimize for this sort of thing. Um, and so one intuition um, we can use to build something that will to optimize for minimax regret would be to uh, start from adversarial training. So this is just like you have an adversary, it directly builds an environment for the single RL agents to train in, which we'll call the protagonist. Um, so a way to modify adversarial training to make it go more towards minimax regret would be to add an extra agent we call the antagonist. And so now we have an adversary during like one environment, which the protagonist and the antagonist both try to solve. And so we set up the objectives for the agents um, as shown here. So the adversary is trying to uh, maximize the regret between the protagonist and the antagonist, where the regret is, um, it's trying to make uh, the reward high for the antagonist and low for the protagonist. Um, so you can sort of think of the adversary as on the antagonist's team. Um, the ad antagonist is just trying to also maximize that regret and the protagonist is trying to minimize that regret. So you can sort of see it as a two team zero sum game. Um, and if you, one thing that's important to note is if you look at the antagonist and the protagonist's um, objectives, well, so the, the protagonist is trying to minimize the regret. It can't do anything about this term. Um, it has no control over what the other agent does in the environment. So all it can focus on is trying to maximize its own reward. And so the protagonist and the antagonist can be equally thought of as just trying to maximize their own reward in their environments, as if they don't understand anything about the game. Um, and actually, when you want to do this in practice, you just have them maximize their own reward. You don't even tell them about the rest of the game because it's just a variance reduction strategy. Like the, the other part of the game is just going to add noise to their rewards. Um, cool. And so we call this protagonist antagonist induced regret environment design, or paired. Um, because that's what the acronym generator um, told us to do. Um, and we thought it was pretty good. Um, so one thing that we wanted to, um, actually, before I move on, um, this is a good place to stop for questions because oftentimes, I think there's a few misunderstandings of this possibly floating around. And if anybody has a question that they might have misunderstood, like feels at all confused about what this will do, um, this is a great place to ask because I think I've probably not explained it 100% well. Yeah. Uh, how do you choose the antagonist? Um, so in this version, the antagonist is just fixed throughout the whole time. So you, there's just like, um, we randomly initialize the protagonist and the antagonist as just two separate networks. And then the antagonist is just fixed, like they're both learning, but um, they have assigned roles. So like whoever is the antagonist is just the antagonist throughout the whole game. Uh, there's a bunch of ways to modify this by like switching the roles and stuff like this. Um, but generally like all of them sort of perform the same right now. Yeah. Is there an issue here where environments that are just hard for all agents are just never selected? Okay, so the question was if the, um, is there an issue where if the environments were, uh, like are hard for all agents and they're never selected. Um, yeah, that, that is a bit of an issue. Um, as long as they all are equally bad at the environments, if some of them are slightly better at the environments then there's still some sort of motivation to select them. Um, but if no agent can solve the environment, then it's sort of indistinguishable from an unsolvable environment. Like no, no, nothing in the system knows whether it is solvable. Um, and so there's, um, it's hard to find a way to sample those environments without also sampling all the unsolvable environments. Um, and so ideally, maybe you'd want some sort of entropy or something, but we haven't really thought too much about it. I'll add in one more question that Stuart had when I first showed this to him. So the other question that he had was, um, why, uh, so if, like, wouldn't the protagonist and antagonist just converge to the same thing? I think is another natural question. Um, and so it turns out what happens is that the protagonist and the antagonist, they start slightly different, right? They're like differently initialized strategies. So they have different random behaviors at the initialization. The adversary um, has then motivation to take advantage of whatever that difference is and to make it really evident in the rollouts because that's what um, 
that's like, like its motivation is to try to make one of them succeed and the other fail. And so it wants to make those rollouts actually quite different, which means that they get different data, which means that the networks get farther apart and so on. Um, and so you should imagine that the protagonist and antagonist, even though they might start with only small differences, um, should come up with somewhat different representations over time. And they should only start converging um, once those differences um, have been made to not matter by them learning to cope with them. Um, cool. So first thing to notice about this um, is that if we allow the adversary and the antagonist to be on the same team, so that they're, they're actually controlled by the same policy, then um, you can actually show that this, the equilibrium of this has to be a minimax regret strategy. And the reason is um, effectively because uh, it, uh, you can apply the minimax there. Um, like it's effectively a zero sum game now. And so the equilibrium has to be, um, yeah, like the equilibrium is always of the form min max of the objective. Um, and so uh, if you don't have this sort of coordination between the two, then we get a weaker result. Um, in this case, all we know is that the um, protagonist is at least as good as the antagonist in every other environment like in every possible environment. Um, and so of the two, we just know that the protagonist is at least as good as the antagonist everywhere. And this sort of gets to your question, Kay, um, where um, if the antagonist and protagonist both find some environment unsolvable and we're in this sort of three player setting, then um, we could get to the equilibrium where the protagonist is better than the antagonist at those environments and then you basically just stop. Um, so one interesting thing about this is that um, you sort of have a natural curriculum where you want to, the adversary is motivated to uh, find un environments that the protagonist doesn't solve. Um, amongst all those environments, the adversary has the motivation to find the ones in which the protagonist uh, or the antagonist solves it the quickest, right? Because the there's this discount factor. So if the antagonist solves it quicker, it's going to have, it's going to get higher reward. And so, um, the protagonist will have higher regret. Um, and so what you should think is that like the adversary first wants to find environments where the protagonist doesn't solve it and then wants to slowly move the goal closer to the starting point until it's sort of just out of the range, like the visual range of the protagonist so that um, the antagonist solves it as quickly as possible. But those environments are also the easiest exploration problems. It just needs to sort of randomly move a little bit and it'll see the goal right at the edge of its vision. Um, and so uh, the idea being that if you are doing these sorts of autocurricula thing or like these paired algorithms in, um, in uh, yeah, if you're doing paired algorithms in situations where there's a large discount factor, then uh, you should expect that it sort of forms this good curriculum. Um, yeah, and so this is just an example of the generated environments. Um, my, yeah, cool. Um, yeah, and so you can sort of see in these generated environments, you sort of see the randomness and the blocking that you would expect. In the paired environments, you start to see some walls forming. So this sort of looks like a labyrinth in the starting situation. And you see that there's like walls that form sort of between the, the agent and the goal. Um, in the uh, more scaled up, um, environment design methods now, you see that these get brighter and brighter and general research advice is anytime you're making any sort of method, try to visualize everything because actually visually looking at what's happening and like watching the videos of the relics are probably the most easy way to debug what's actually going on. Um, there's been several times where I've been on projects where like weeks have been wasted just by not looking at the rollouts. And so look at the rollouts, look at the environments. Um, and if it doesn't look like it's doing the thing that you want the system to do, then that's probably a warning sign. Um, and yeah, we see that like if you uh, try these agents in human designed environments, so these are not environments that the agent would have seen at all during training unless the adversary decided to make something weirdly human-like, um, you find that the paired agent actually is able to transfer to these environments remarkably well. Um, Cool. And we can see the videos of the agents actually going through. Um, these agents are actually, uh, yeah, this was good for, for the time, but now they're much more efficient at going through the mazes. 
Um, cool. And so before I go too far, um, yeah, so uh, I won't go into as much detail as um, to what's been happening in the field since then, um, but I wanted to at least let people know sort of where the state of the art is. Um, so one thing that helps significantly uh, is PLR. So PLR is uh, effectively, you can think of it as a way of trying to get a proxy for regret. It doesn't need two agents. Um, and so rather than, um, rather than having two agents, you have one agent and then you compute some sort of score from their rollouts and you try to make this some sort of proxy for regret so that you don't need some other agent. And the score that people typically use here is value loss or um, like there's a few different variants on like um, proxy metrics around value loss. We found that most of these correlate quite well with regret. Um, and so at least in the short term, I expect that like uh, we'll want to be using these sorts of PLR based methods rather than the pairs based methods because the um, because the score, if it correlates very well with regret, you're still going to get a good distribution of environments and you don't need two agents for it. Um, I expect in the long run, this is going to go away because like every proxy for a measure is at some point when you optimize it hard enough is going to see, cease to be a good proxy for the thing you're shooting for. And so I think that we haven't quite gotten to the point where we've optimized this proxy hard enough that we actually need to go for a ground truth regret. But um, in the short term, this is something that's going to be pretty efficient. So I expect most people will want to use um, PLR based methods to when they're starting out in the field. Um, Better than PLR though is robust PLR, which basically just like, um, so it has this sort of buffer of levels that it's, it's sampling. And rather than like it, when it comes up with a new level because it's trying to get its measure of value loss off of the rollouts of the agents, it needs to roll out an agent in that level. And so the default thing is, well, I have to roll out an agent in the level, might as well train on it. Turns out that that's a bad idea, that training on those levels actually makes the policy learn slower. Um, the intuition being that those aren't really curated levels. Those are, those are just random levels. And this, um, like, uh, the random levels are of such low quality compared to the curated levels that they just mess up the training dynamics and make it much harder for the system to converge. So if you just run the rollouts, but you just don't train on these sorts of samples that you have to take anyway, um, system works a lot better. Um, and then the final thing that really helps a lot is rather than trying to use an RL agent to design the environments, so like rather than using like an LSTM to place all of these blocks in all of these places, um, that's a very long horizon um, decision problem. Like you have to place like a hundred blocks and then you get a reward of one or zero, um, or like, like you get a reward of like whatever the agent's reward was, and then you have to do that again. Um, and it's like a very long horizon, somewhat slow task. Um, better than doing that is to just evolve environments um, like if you intuitively think about it, um, evolution is much better suited for this sort of domain. It's just like a very wide domain with not a very like strong feedback signal. Uh, and so, uh, one of the key things that's changed in the field since the original paper is that people have started using evolutionary methods to, um, evolve, uh, the different environments, um, based off of, uh, yeah, based off of these sorts of proxies of regret that, um, PLR proposed. Um, and so I'm not going to go too deep into all of the empirics behind this, but if you're interested, uh, you should go to excelagent.github.io. There's an interactive demo where you can see all the agents running in browser um, and adjust sort of things about the environment to see what the agent will do when it sort of walks uh, over different sorts of environments. Um, and this thing over on the left is what happens when you actually take an agent that's trained with these sorts of Excel-like levels and uh, transfer it to very large mazes that are out of distribution. You find that it learns something like the right hand rule and so these really robust sort of transferable policies. Um, cool. Um, and so I'm running a bit low on time, but I still want to, uh, yeah, I'll just, okay. So I guess one other thing that people should know about regret is that minimax regret is actually uh, still a form of expected value maximization. It's actually consistent with expected value maximization. Easiest way of seeing this is that minimax regret is the Nash equilibrium for the paired game. Nash equilibrium um, are maximizing expected value with respect to their opponents. So 
the protagonist agent is actually maximum expected value with respect to the adversary. Um, another thing to keep uh, an eye on is this notion of a regret floor. So people, um, recently we published this paper basically pointing out that uh, minimax regret agents, once there's like some limit to how much you can reduce re your regret. And once you've reduced your re regret to that limit, you don't want to really reduce it any farther. So one example of this is if you have like a, like a game where you're betting on heads or tails, um, but you also have this like safe heads or safe tails where like if the bank defaults while you're betting, um, then like you get your money back. Um, so like you're betting, like by default, you would be betting $50 on this thing. But like in the meantime, if the bank defaults, um, then like it's not like you lose all your money, right? Um, and so... Um, in this case, like you're already betting like a hundred dollars, like you're going to get a, uh, I guess a regret of $50 because you're going to be randomizing between, um, heads and tails. And so you could farther reduce your regret on like this outcome to, um, $25, but you don't really care because like the worst case regret is the only thing you care about. Um, and so a minimax regret agent is going to be indifferent between using heads and safe heads, whereas actually we would want them to prefer the safer option. Um, there's this interesting temporal consistency, con inconsistency example, which I think is maybe a bit too in the weeds, but um, we can talk about it later. Um, yeah, and also maybe that's a bit too in the weeds. Um, cool. Um, and so this is just getting back to the idea that there are a lot of different sorts of environment objectives that people could be going for. Here's an example of some of my favorites, but there's a lot more that I couldn't fit on the slides. Um, so this is like Lexi regret and um, level perfect regret, which are ways of trying to handle this idea that the um, that there's a regret floor and trying to optimize even though there's a regret floor. Um, sampler is on, in the domain where you have some distribution that you trust, but you want to be robust to sorts of tail cases. And so this is regularizing the performance of the agent so that it still understands that there's like some sort of prior distribution out there, um, even though the distribution of levels is changing. Um, then there's things like dread, which are just going for completely sorts of different objectives, not really like decision theory based, but are just trying to um, make sure that the, um, the, uh, the levels have high entropy um, or like high uh, or low mutual information with the output vectors um, of the policy network, just like as a way of encouraging some sort form of transferability. Um, I think this space is, there's just like a lot of different things you can do in this space. I think that it's, even though there's a lot of exploration going on in it, it's still underexplored. And I think people should try a bunch of stuff because um, I think like there's not been enough thinking about it and who knows what's out there. Um, and so finally, this is getting back to the promised thing earlier where uh, where do we get these sorts of distributions of environments? So um, in, or, in order for environment design to be useful at scale, we're going to need to be able to design environments which um, capture a complex range of different things and ideally be able to complex, uh, be able to capture the sorts of photorealistic environments that we're going to want our agents eventually to be deployed in. Um, and so the main direct, there's sort of two main directions here. Um, one is the sort of full generative world models that give you photorealistic sorts of generations from like action condition um, data. And so it's, you can effectively think of it as like trying to solve sim to real by first solving real to sim. Um, and so the idea is just being to do real to sim to real. Um, and it seems like those methods as with the rest of generative AI have really gotten to work quite well over the past like uh, few years. And I expect that trend to continue. Um, as people scale it up and feed it more data. Um, the other option is to generate all the environments from code. Um, so this is trying to like, uh, yeah, I think uh, a few people have talked about Epic uh, over the past week. Um, this is, that's the other alternative. Um, quickly, um, I'm going to go over how, like recent work on how we can uh, uh, scale this approach on the left, like this fully generative approach to domains where we don't even have action data. So Gaia over there was conditioned on actual driving steering data. Um, the, con the question we wanted to know is, can we, um, yeah, can we do this with just all the videos on the internet? Like, can we just take random internet videos and infer what sorts of things you can do in them? 
and then just make a generative environment out of that. Um, and if this was the case, then we could massively scale because we're not bottlenecked by the data that we can get with action labels. We could use any video that we see anywhere on the internet. Um, and so, yeah, I've sort of covered that, um, but here's the, so the general schema of this model would be, you have, you take in uh, input videos, um, you have a video tokenizer, which just like tokenizes the videos into space, which you, is easier for people to predict. Um, and then we have a latent action model, which tries to infer latent actions from those frames to try to figure out which actions were taken. And then from that, we train a dynamics model, which sees all of the uh, video tokens in the past and the latent actions at every frame um, and tries to predict what the future frames will look like. And so at uh, test time, we throw away the latent action model and we just plug in our own latent actions, just like I made an interface where I can push all the buttons and see what happens. Um, and what you get out the other end is a, uh, a system where you can put in an initial frame and press the actions and generate all the frames as you go, um, just like a video game, right? Like all a video game is, is a video to like a controllable video model, right? Um, and so the crux of this is how the latent action model works. So the latent action model sees all the past frames um, or the encoder sees all the past frames and one frame into the future, tries to compress that future frame into a single latent variable. So this can take on one of 10 values. Um, and then the latent uh, decoder model sees all the past frames and just this latent value and then tries to predict the future frame. So you can see this as sort of a um, compression of the future into one of 10 bits, right? Or one of 10 options. Um, cool, and then we predict that. Um, what we found is that we get a bunch of reasonable scaling laws um, when you like try to scale this up. So if we keep adding data and compute, we expect this to keep getting better. So this is, um, if you start from the same starting frame and you just put in different actions, so you play different games, you'll see, uh, you'll see the agent sort of, yeah, you'll be able to like go and explore the world and do all the sorts of things you would expect um, in an exploration, like in when you're exploring in a video game. Um, and then if you throw in out of distribution images, so this is particularly, this is just like a Lego figure on a little eraser on my friend's desk. Um, you can go and like play it as if it's like actually a platformer game. Um, and so this is just like us pressing the jump and run right button and going and being able to control it. And what we find is that these actions are actually very consistent. So if you take a bunch of different frames and you press the same latent actions um, in like the same order in a bunch of um, different, um, like visually different environments, you'll find that they actually all jitter in the same way. Like it's learned some sort of consistent mapping um, that works across all of the different environments. And we've also seen like emergent effects like parallax. So uh, th these are the actions for like right, down, left, up. And so you can see how like the movement at the, at the like front here is like faster than the movement in the back. So it like gives this illusion that they have a, that they like it's sort of a 3D environment. Um, it works in like other domains. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna stop there for questions, but uh, happy to go back or dive into any of the details either now or in the question and answer session later. Thank you, Michael. All right, first question is, how do you consider environmental design when it comes to self-play with large language models? So self-play with large language models is an interesting case. I, I guess I don't know what you're what, what the question's referring to, if it's referring to like the dynamic distribution of the other agent, or if it's referring to like trying to use these agents in some sort of like deployment environment. Um, if you're talking about the dynamic distribution of other agents, I think that like a lot of the things from like the self-play literature, like the things that like um, have worked in like alpha zero or like, uh, like XLAN, these sorts of like um, multi-agent generative environments are probably applicable. A lot of people are probably trying that right now. Um, but I think that you end up with a lot of the same sort of decision theoretic issues of like the regret floor and like um, like just a really wide amount of diversity in the space that might lead you to sort of rabbit hole. 
Um, I guess where I see the environment design coming in more specifically is when you try to make these like language agents um, into being like more physical agents, like when you're trying to like use them to drive some sort of um, like robotics or self driving car sort of system um, where you have to actually simulate reality. I expect um, more of these things start to uh, like the rubber hitting the road more when you get there. Do we need to change the objective to encourage cooperative capability in multi-agent environments? Um, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I think that like, uh, yeah, so I guess my general perspective is that if you, so LLMs might have some notion of cooperation sort of baked in, but it's going to, uh, like to the degree that they're mimicking cooperative behaviors of humans. And so I don't think we should expect them to be any more or less cooperative than humans um, until you start to do like RLHF or other sorts of optimization on them, which drive them towards doing a more sort of like um, game theoretic or decision theoretic sort of behavior. Like it's becoming less like the humans that are in the training data and more like the uh, economists models of them that we're using, like we're training them towards. And so those models tend to defect more often and be less cooperative than humans generally. And so I expect that like, yeah, the more optimization we put on them, the less cooperative they'll probably be. Do we have any way to approximate regret and improve it in settings where there is no clear notion of success? Is this just open-endedness? Yeah, it might just be open-endedness. Um, I think that like, Better approximations of regret probably just come from larger populations and more diverse populations. Um, I mean, I, I think like none of us know what the optimal thing to do is. And the, to the degree that we know anything about what the optimal thing to do is, it's that we have a lot of smart people trying to think of op more optimal things to do and trying to compare those to what other people are thinking. Um, and so like, yeah, like optimality, like at least during training, isn't something that we're going to ever have access to. And so we just need to find ways of... Uh, yeah, find ways of continuing to continuing to improve towards like a minimum regret solution, even though we're never going to quite be there. Um, one last question, because our videographer needs to run off. Um, but Michael will have office hours after this. Um, last question: Why do you think UED leads to better out of distribution generalization, even if there are no guarantees about how the minimax regret policy performs out of distribution? Um, yeah, so th there are, uh, I mean, there are some guarantees about how the like optimal minimum aggregate policy uh, works out of distribution, at least out of distribution in terms of things that are expressible in the environment space. Um, so if, like, if you performed very badly in some particular environment, then the adversary has a lot of motivation to make that environment so that it gets a lot of, like, that's an environment where you get a lot of regret. Uh, and so you should expect that a, um, yeah, so you should expect that a minimum aggregate regret policy um, has failure modes that are at least hard enough to find that the adversary isn't finding them. Um, and so this isn't like a guarantee, but it's very hard to get any sort of guarantees in um, deep RL. And so I think that's sort of as close as we know how to get right now. Um, if anybody has a more tractable way of getting harder guarantees, then I'll jump ship and go to that direction. All right. Uh, one last round of applause for Michael, please.